my name is Dr. Quinn Livin and um, I'm a neuromuscular specialist. I run the National Service for Patients with Mercardal Disease. Uh, this service is currently at the Robert Jones Lifers Hunt Hospital in Oswald Street, but it uh, may be moving uh, sometime later this year. I'm pleased to be able to talk to you about mercardal disease, which is a, a rare metabolic muscle condition. And to understand the condition and how it affects people, it's important to understand about the fuels that muscles need for exercise. If you think of your muscles as being like an engine needing petrol, then there are two types of fuel that are needed. The first fuel is called glycogen, which is starch, and it's stored in the muscle, and it is converted through a process called glycolysis to glucose, which is sugar. And that in turn, uh, through a number of stages, is converted to ATP, which, is, which provides energy for muscles to contract. And this uh, fuel is used for anaerobic activity. And by anaerobic activity, we mean strenuous exercise, such as running or walking upstairs, or lifting heavy weights or carrying heavy shopping. It also means uh, tensing up the muscles without moving them. For example, squatting, or when you get very angry and your muscles tighten. The other type of activity is aerobic activity, which is walking or gentle cycling. It's not strenuous activity. And this exercise requires a different form of fuel, which is delivered through a pathway called beta oxidation. And these fuels are the free fatty acids that are formed in your bloodstream from breaking down fat. And they too, eventually, after a number of steps, form energy in the form of ATP, which enables the muscles to move. Mercardal disease is quite rare. We don't know exactly the frequency of the condition, but it's been estimated to be somewhere between 1 in 100,000 newborn babies and 1 in 350,000. And that would equate to between 200 and 600 people in the United Kingdom affected with the condition. It's caused by an abnormal copy, or two abnormal copies, of uh, an exon in the gene for the enzyme muscle phosphorylase. And in order to have mercardal disease, both parents will have to be carriers for the condition. And those parents will have a risk of passing it on to one in four of their children. However, the risk of an affected person passing the condition on to their own children is extremely small because they would have to uh, find a partner who is also a carrier for the condition. So, as I've already mentioned, it's caused by an absence of an enzyme called muscle phosphorylase. And this enzyme is very necessary to convert glycogen to glucose for energy during anaerobic exercise. Glucose is an essential fuel during the first few minutes of activity and during strenuous, strenuous exercise and eccentric muscle contraction. And as I've already alluded to, eccentric muscle contraction is when the muscles are tense but not moving. So this occurs when you're weightlifting, if you're squatting down, or if you're tensing muscles, such as, for example, if your favorite team scores a goal and you clench your fists. There is a phenomenon that is unique to people with McArdle's disease, and that is the second wind. In the first three minutes of exercise, uh, the body uses glucose that's already in the bloodstream, but between three and seven minutes of exercise, it requires um, glycogen to be broken down to glucose. And people with mercardal disease cannot do this. But after about seven or eight minutes of exercise, the second pathway uh, starts to become activated, and this is the fatty acid, uh, fatty, fatty acid, fatty acid oxidation pathway. Uh, and this enables muscles to start to burn free fatty acids and for gentle aerobic exercise people with the condition can continue the activity 
without getting pain or muscle cramping. So people with myocardial disease will experience cramps occurring at about three minutes of activity. Uh, it will develop into a second wind after about seven to eight minutes of activity where the pain subsides. But if the, pay, if the person affected with the condition continues to exercise at the same intensity when they're getting pain or cramping, then they may get muscle damage. And this muscle damage leads to a breakdown of the muscle protein, which is called myoglobin. And this muscle protein is then seen in the urine as a reddish color, or in extreme circumstances, a Coca-Cola colored urine. And this is called myoglobinuria. And if myoglobinuria is very heavy, if the urine is extremely dark, and sometimes it can even look as though it contains bits, it can lead to acute renal failure. And this is because the myoglobin protein is just slightly too large to get through the pores of the kidney, and it clogs them up, rather like a tea strainer will get clogged up with tea if there are too many tea leaves. This is only a temporary problem and it can be treated, but if it occurs, it is quite serious. People with myocardial disease also have an increased risk of gout, and this is because their muscles are breaking down protein for energy, as well as using free fatty acids. So myoglobinuria, um, as I've already mentioned, is this very dark Coca-Cola colored urine. So this slide just gives you an idea of what it looks like. And at the mildest end of the spectrum, it just looks rather reddish. Uh, compared with normal, while at the extreme end of the spectrum it can look thick and very dark, almost blackish in colour. The diagnosis of myocardial disease is first suggested by a blood test for a muscle enzyme called creatine kinase, which is almost always raised above normal. And the next investigation would be a muscle biopsy, looking for increased levels of glycogen and complete absence of the enzyme muscle phosphorylase. The diagnosis can then be confirmed with genetic studies. 75% of the British population will have one of two specific mutations called R50X or G205S, and these mutations can be routinely screened for. If they are not found, then the sample will need to go for full gene sequencing which takes a little longer to get a result. There have been, over the years, many clinical trials looking for different treatments that might potentially benefit people with myocardial disease. These have included oral ribose, glucagon, which is a substance that breaks down glycogen, branched chain amino acids, which are the uh, building blocks of protein, Vitamin B6, because this is a cofactor for storing phosphorylase, verapamil, creatine, gentamicin, and ramipril. Unfortunately, none of these trials have shown any benefit of any of these treatments. There have been some small studies which have shown some benefit. One study gave uh, individuals sucrose in the form of a fizzy drink such as coca-cola before taking exercise in a gym and this study showed that patients had a second second wind and so their exercise capacity improved unfortunately one of the side effects of this is that it can lead to weight gain so it can be a useful treatment if you're planning to do exercise in a gym or uh, as part of a sporting activity that is going to burn off the sugar, but it is not practical for everyday use. Another study suggested that low-dose creatine might benefit patients, but this was a very small study, and only a half of the patients reported some benefit. Interestingly, high-dose creatine made people worse, and in my clinic we have treated about 40 patients with creatine, and none of them opted to continue taking the treatment because they did not find it beneficial. One recent study suggested that a high carbohydrate diet might be better than a high protein diet, but this study was only of seven patients and it was not blinded. 
so it may have been open to buyers. However, at the moment, it is worth trying carbohydrate as a diet to see if it will help. Certainly there's no evidence that a high protein diet is beneficial. And finally, there is growing evidence that aerobic training could benefit people with myocardial disease because this tends to increase the efficiency of the switch to fatty acid oxidation during exercise. So we recommend gentle aerobic training for 30 minutes at least three times a week. And this training would include walking, for example, or gentle cycling on a static bicycle. And we found that people feel better when they do this. We've not found any evidence of muscle damage. And we found that their performance improves and they find it easier to exercise because they find it easier to develop a second wind. However, it's very important for people with myocardial disease to know how to exercise safely. And this means pacing your speed for the first few minutes of exercise. When you first feel your muscles tiring or they feel uncomfortable, it is extremely important to slow down or even stop and take a rest. Wait for a minute for the pain to improve. And then when it seems to be uh, declining, you can start to increase your speed of walking. We use a Borg pain scale to help people understand the level of pain that is acceptable. Really, pain is perhaps not the best word, but sensation. And we suggest to people that they should not let any sensation in their muscles exceed level four. This is a Borg pain scale, and you can see that zero is no pain at all, whereas 10 is extremely strong, perhaps the worst pain you might have ever experienced. And as you can see, level four is really moderate discomfort. And it might, it's very important that when you are doing activities, you do not exceed this level of pain. In fact, we would prefer that you keep your symptoms to within level two, which is a weak sensation. By doing this, you can avoid myoglobinuria, and we would strongly advise you to avoid this because of the potential dangers. It can be avoided by pacing your activity so that you do not carry on at the same intensity when you experience pain. And secondly, you must absolutely avoid lifting heavy objects or actively weightlifting. And you must avoid strenuous activity. For example, if you are hurrying to catch a train or a plane, it is safer to let the plane go than try and run and give yourself uh, some muscle damage. If you notice a, a light form of myoglobinuria, a reddish discoloration of your urine, we would advise you to drink plenty of fluids to wash it through the kidneys. And you may find that your muscles are sore as well, and it is quite safe to take painkillers during this time. However, we do not recommend routine painkillers for, for normal pain that occurs with activity. If you have very dark or heavy myoglobinuria, you might feel very unwell. You might feel as though you have a flu-like illness. You may vomit, you may have a fever, and you might have even collapsed. Under these circumstances, it is very important that you go to your nearest hospital, where they will administer intravenous fluids and pain relief. And they will also assess your urine output to ensure that you do not develop kidney failure. If you do, then you may require a short period of time on dialysis. So really, the best way to manage this is to absolutely avoid it by preventing myoglobinuria, which you can easily do by managing your activity. So in summary, as I've already mentioned, it is very important for you to pace your exercise for the first 10 minutes. If you develop a sensation of pain or cramping in your muscles, stop what you're doing immediately or slow down if you're walking. Absolutely avoid weightlifting, strenuous exercise or tensing up your muscles for more than one or two minutes and do not squat. Take regular gentle aerobic exercise at least three times a week 
and go to hospital if you experience very dark myoglobinuria or if you feel unwell with flu-like symptoms, severe muscle pain, collapse or a slowing down of your urine output. Finally, um, it may be helpful for you to know that there is a very good support group for people with myocardial disease that can be um, accessed through the website for the Association of Glycogen Storage Disorders. And an information leaflet about the condition can be downloaded free of charge from the Muscular Dystrophy Campaign website at this web address.